When Lost Secrets of the Sacred Ark was first published, 10 months ago, there were scientists claiming that there was no such thing as monatomic gold. Well, that was their view then. These are some of the things that we get in today's scientific press. There is masses of this information. All about monatomic gold, about nanowires made from monatomic elements, and about their uses in various forms of technology. These powders, which were associated gold in Mesopotamia, they were called shamana. In um, Egypt, they were called mufkut. So they had all these strange names. The Alexandrians called it the Paradise Stone. It's not a stone, it's a powder, but they called it the Paradise Stone. And in all cases, whether it was shamana, mufkut, Paradise Stone, or whatever, they all said this is a mysterious powder of projection, a powder of projection, and, and the various cultures were unanimous on that particular description. They said it has powers of levitation, powers of transmutation, of teleportation. It seemed to be a vehicle uh, by which they would communicate with gods. It was something to do with the afterlife of, of the Egyptian pharaohs. And they also said it was a key to active longevity. Because of this, people were able to live a long time, particularly the Egyptian pyramid texts. They talk about the material. It's called Mufkut. The pyramid texts come from the 5th Dynasty tomb at Saqqara of, of King Unas. Here is described something called the Field of Mufkuts. And this is interesting because this moves into modern science again, the Field of Mufkuts. This material was meant to have a field around it or about it or that it was associated with that was very magical and very powerful and was the field in which the pharaohs would communicate with the gods. It was the field that determined their final gateway to the afterlife. The stories of this field turn up, they've kept finding these. Mufkut cones, bread, light. It was about bread, it was about something the kings ingested they were eating this material that was formed into little cakes, but it was a powder. The Old Testament book of Exodus gives us a, a really good example of this in operation. Uh, it took the longest time before anybody even thought to ask a question about this little bit of the story in Exodus. Many of you will know the story. Moses had been up the mountain. He would come down with the Ten Commandments, and then he broke the tablets because he got terribly angry to see that his brother Aaron had collected all the gold earrings from the Israelites and melted them down and made a golden calf as an idol of worship. And he said, well, that may, may be the way we used to do things. We don't do that anymore. We have this new culture here that we're part of, and I've just spoken to the Lord of this culture, and we don't worship graven images anymore. And he got very angry. And then it says this, that he took the golden calf, he burns it with fire, he transposed it with powder, mixed that with water and fed it to the Israelites. Interesting little story. He took the gold, burnt it with fire, and transposed it into powder. That doesn't work. You, you heat gold with fire or burn gold with fire, you get molten gold, you don't get powder. Nobody, it seems, thought to ask the question. They use this to make bread. They could mix it with frankincense, the Bible tells us, and mold little bread cakes which the ancient, the most ancient Bible text that we have, the Septuagint, the, the old Greek Bible, calls bread of the presence, presumably bread of the presence of God or, or of something important. Shemana means firestone. This is a relief from that temple, another relief showing a bread presentation again. It was always linked with bread. They were always little conical shapes. We know that from about 2,500 BC, the pharaohs, in Egypt, or the kings before they became pharaohs in Greek times, um, were ingesting the bread cakes of this white powder substance. Only the metallurgical adepts knew the secret of its manufacture. Metallurgical adepts, yep, it's made from metal, that makes sense. The high priest of the temples had a very strange title. The high priests of the Egyptian temples were called the great artificers. Well, a great artificer is, a, is a, a, a worker in materials, particularly metals. So that was sort of interesting. It's beginning to link together. And thinking back to Petri's concept, yeah, these were places of worship, not worship. Temples were not the same as churches that evolved from the concept.
I actually looked in just the English language word etymological dictionary from Oxford University, which traces the origin of words, and lo and behold, I only had to go back 700 years to discover that the word we now use as worship had a K in the middle of it. It was workship. They used to work for the gods. They didn't used to worship the gods. They used to work for the gods, whoever the gods were. It was said that this was the food of the light body. They said we all have bodies, but we don't just have physical bodies, we have light bodies. And just as we feed our physical bodies, they said, we have to feed our light bodies so that they will be nurtured and grow in, in the same way. They have to be as fulfilled as the physical body. And they call the light body the car. Well, it's interesting because scientists in recent times have actually called this material the light of life because it resonates with DNA on the same frequency. It's a light wave. We find lots of references to Mufkas. Um, this relief here, this picture, uh, this drawing was actually done by the, the, the uh, Russian scholar Emmanuel Velikovsky, and he drew this up simply to give us an image of, of, of this relief at Karnak, at the Temple of Karnak. That sh this shows the treasures of, of the Pharaoh Tutmosis, the um, third. Mufkut in e Egyptian law was always portrayed as a cone shape. Now these things sit there in the gold section um, and it says underneath these are gold but we call them bread. The Alexandrians wrote of them and said they were called the Great White Brotherhood because they were absolutely obsessed with a mysterious white powder. And they made some interesting comments. They said that they call it the Paradise Stone, and it has unique qualities in as much as that it can weigh far more than its own original quantity of gold. But even a feather can tip the scales against it. So it can be a lot heavier than the gold it came from, or it can be lighter than a feather. This stuff has the ability to change its weight very, very dramatically. It's always in the old text associated with light, with enlightenment, with illumination of some sort. It's, it's a light illumination that seems to have to do with the acquisition of knowledge and wisdom, that, that sort of illumination and enlightenment. They're activating bits of our system now with this material that never seemed to have any purpose before. Why do we only use a fraction of our brain power? Why don't we use the rest? Well, it's there to be used if we knew what to do with it. We need the trigger. We need the unlocking device. These materials are it. They're what was used to feed the car, the light body, to, to give anti-aging, to, to restore the youth, to take the pharaohs into the afterlife or whatever. There's an institute in um, Switzerland called the Alpha Learning Institute. The chief research director there is a fellow called Sean Adam. Sean Adam for 10 years has been the world's memory and speed reading champion. He can read a 300 book in 24 minutes. He reads at a speed of 3,850 words a minute. Uh, not only can he do all of that, he remembers it all and he can be tested on anything. He's also got his joint holder of the sixth highest IQ ever recorded. So th this guy has, has been running with others this research institute for the longest time which is linked up to government and corporate institutions and they specialize in learning difficulties in behavioral patterns and behavioral difficulties Any, anything that that might be linked to behavioral science uh, uh, along to finding cures for dyslexia ADHD learning deficiencies you know things of that sort and they're the primary institute in the world for fronting these things well from October 2002 until January 2003, as a, uh, a little three to four month period there, they decided to test monatomic elements. Ten volunteers, five male, five female, average age somewhere between 17 and 52, and they were fed simply orally with these materials, with uh, monatomic elements, these powders, regularly and irregularly, just to test the reaction. Well, the results were in their words, staggering. Sean Adam, he wrote, what we are seeing here is really quite amazing. The tests show it to be highly effective. The effect is immediate and 
cumulative. What they do here is, is to work on brainwave patterns and they try to synchronize uh, these things and they found that this material could do it. The theory and the logic behind it is that the better balancing between left and right brain produces, and these are their words, a greater intelligence, enhanced creativity, improved mind-body coordination, more agility and less stress. Well, okay, that makes sense. If we're operating as we should be, that's what we should have. But we're none of us really operating as we should be. We're operating with all of this left brain uh, thing going and not too much of the right. Well, here are the charts here. These are just average charts. There are hundreds and hundreds of these. They took everybody's brainwave scans as they were, they were going along. Now, the top chart sh shows a, a normal starting base where, in effect, and this would be any one of us at any moment in time, the brainwaves coming off the left side were far outweighing those, the red ones, on the, the right-hand side of the brain. The effects, they say, is immediate and cumulative. At the bottom is the first immediate effect. What happens is that the left has now contracted back to meet the right, and they both, and the right's grown just a little bit, but they've absolutely synchronized. The left and the right brain of this person, and this is the immediate effect, has now begun. And then they say it's cumulative, because what then happens is that it all grows to where the blue one was at the beginning. Quite extraordinary. Our research clearly shows that the left-right brain imbalances predominate in many mental behavioral dysfunctions, such as dyslexia and ADHD. It is our professional opinion that the monatomic products would be of tremendous benefit in any of these conditions. It is the most obvious answer as a healthy alternative to chemicals that have harmful side effects. To that, Sean Adam, the director, adds, if I were going to take an exam, mental or physical, I would take monatomic elements immediately beforehand. The worst that could happen is that there would be a little improvement. There could be a lot. What about somebody who's permanently doing this, getting those into balance and growing with it? This is exactly what the old text told us that these things would do. They made them into bread cakes. They fed them to the priests. They fed them to the pharaohs. It gave them longevity. It gave them extra creativity. It enhanced their perception. It enhanced their intuition. It enhanced their awareness. All the qualities of leadership came from the Mufkat, from the Shimana, from these golden cakes that they called bread. It's clear from the evidence of all these ancient things that it didn't matter what they called things. It didn't matter that they didn't understand perhaps the true science that we're beginning to understand now. What they did know is that it worked. It did certain things. And they told us about that. So even if they didn't understand it, they presented things as sort of communicating with gods and, and, and priests who were able to disappear before their very eyes and things. But these are all things that this enables to be done now. In Greek mythology, it was the one substance that sat right at the very heart of the golden fleece legend. It was what the quest was all about, the secrets of, of manufacture of this material. It's linked up with the Ark of the Covenant, that famous golden coffer that Moses had built at the uh, mountain in Sinai and took to Jerusalem where the temple was constructed to house it. So this most valuable artifact, the Ark of the Covenant, was entirely tied up with this science in some way, as we shall see. Our stone is nothing but gold. Our stone is nothing but gold. It's gold digested to the highest degree of purity and subtle fixation. We call it a stone only because of its fixed nature, because it resists the action of fire as successfully as, as any stone. In species, it's more pure than any gold that it comes from. But its appearance is that of a very fine white powder. That was the philosopher's stone straight from the hand of the most famous chemist, alchemist of his time. We go back 200 years, we go back to the 15th century, we, we can look at the last testament of Nicholas Flamel, probably the best known of, of all the great alchemists of all time, uh, a fellow who spent 20 years from a very poor base studying his science and ended up probably as the greatest and wealthiest benefactor that France has ever known.
He made the point on the 22nd of November, 1416, when writing his last testament, exactly the same. Our stone is gold, but it's perfectly prepared gold. It's a fine powder of gold. That is our philosopher's stone. So we have a whole new perspective here. We have a perspective that says the philosopher's stone, despite all the propaganda, despite all the church has done to try and make it look silly, is not about turning anything into gold. It is gold. It's gold in the highest possible, purest form that it ever could be. And that white powder that we looked at earlier was exactly that. That was 24 karat gold. What's the gold that the Philosopher's Stone makes? The Great Enlightenment. Not the Great Enlightenment of money and wealth and riches and a lump of gold. The Great Enlightenment of wisdom and learning and intuition. That's the real Holy Grail. That's, that's the true Enlightenment. We can leap forward in time now and see how these old stories match up with what's been going on. And it begins right here in the United States. It begins in 1976 and it begins um, in Phoenix, Arizona. A very, very apt place actually because the word Phoenix was Old Phoenician and it means red gold. It all began with a farmer, a cotton farmer, a third generation cotton farmer just outside Phoenix called David Hudson. He's your average American farmer. He wasn't a physicist, he wasn't a scientist, he was nothing. He certainly wasn't an alchemist. He was destined to become all of them. His father had been Commissioner of Agriculture for the state of Arizona. But what they discovered was that, that it was reading all of these zero weights, below zero, but they thought, well, what about the pan? That should weigh something. So they tipped the material out and put the pan back, and it suddenly weighed more without the material in it than it did when it was in it. This stuff was not only levitating, it was carrying the pan with it. So they discovered that this stuff would levitate, they discovered it would disappear, they didn't quite know why or where it went to, and they knew that it was important for, for energy. They knew that if it was a superconductor, it could attract energy, it could store energy, and it could distribute energy. The, the, the old stories of the power and the Ark of the Covenant began to, to ring bells here about the, the, this potential that they had the ability with the use of this material to store and distribute enormous quantities of energy. So it's no wonder they will levitate and, and whatever, you know, there's nothing to them, but cooling will make them heavy. The ancient Egyptians had their mufkusti, a white bread that was offered as gold to the gods. The ancient Israelites had their showbread and their manna, which they kept in the Ark of the Covenant. Stuart Nettleton wrote, Jewish Midrashim commentaries describe how the Ark of the Covenant levitated and carried along some of the people who were supposed to be carrying it. it. So if somebody thought anti-gravity would be great, here we go. The ancient Egyptians had the sacrament of the bread and the wine, as do the Christians. On the right you see an offering of white bread and wine to the gods. Moses took the golden calf which the Israelites made for worship and burned it in the fire and ground it to a powder and strawed it upon the water and made the children of Israel drink of it. So how, how do you burn gold? What, what happens when you heat gold up? It melts. It doesn't burn. But I burned gold and made it into a powder and put it in water and eaten it. And it isn't, it isn't something that's so difficult that you have to have a science lab. I did it in my backyard. It's easy to do. You can do it with simple basic stuff. In Pillar of Celestial Fire, Robert Cox wrote, the Vedic seers called this powder basma, or ash, because it resembled a fine white ash, and because it was the final product left over when ordinary matter was exposed repeatedly to the fiery process of tapas, or spiritual evolution. The ancient Chinese alchemist Wei Po Yang wrote of the pill of immortality, an edible powder from gold. After one ingests it, the complexion becomes rejuvenated. Hoary hair regains its blackness, and new teeth grow where fallen ones used to be. If an old man, he will once more become a youth. If an old woman, she will regain her maidenhood. That sounds useful. Yeah. There's Wei Po Yang. He's, he's the one on the left. And this little device here, that's a, a, an alchemical furnace. 
Artefius, an alchemist of the 12th century, claimed in his alchemical treatise titled The Secret Book that he had lived for the space of a thousand years or thereabouts, which has now passed over my head since the time I was born to this day through the alone goodness of God Almighty by the use of this wonderful quintessence. So, you know, if he's telling the truth, if that's real, that, that could be helpful too. Has virtue as a solvent and whose volatile spirit are indicated by a bird perched on the tree. This is, this, this is the water that you can hold in your hands and yet it will dissolve gold. It's something you can hold. Now, what, what can you hold in your hands that will dissolve gold? Nothing that we know of now. Here, he's talking about something that would dissolve gold that you could hold in your hand. This is the alchemist. This is on one of the towers of Notre Dame. And according to Falconelli, he's wearing a Phrygian cap, attribute of the adept, negligently placed on his long, thickly curling hair. The scholar, dressed in his working cape, is leaning with one hand on the balustrade and stroking his full, silky beard with the other. Now, this cap is the same as the witch's cap, the dunce cap, all of these caps represent this conical shape. Remember the, the pyramidal or the, the triangular bread in the picture before? Well, that's, that's a, a conical showbread image. And I'll be talking about that a whole lot more in my, in my uh, workshops. But uh, basically, it seems to be a way to energize the ormus. Uh, it's also a vortex, as Callum Coates pointed out this morning. It's a way to enhance the vortex in, uh, in the Ormus materials. So if there is any truth in these ancient stories, then this truth should be open to examination by modern science. We should be able to check into it and get some results.